Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's meeting of the Escondido City Council, as, as well as the Rent Review Board hearing. Please rise for a moment of reflection and remain standing for the flag salute. Yes, please join me in a moment of reflection. We come together tonight to say thank you. Thank you for the privilege, the blessing, the honor it is to serve here in the city of Escondido. We come together tonight as a diverse community, a community of different backgrounds, different beliefs, different presence, and different futures, yet one common goal that is the betterment of this city. We come together tonight to seek guidance, wisdom, and discernment during deliberations that transpire this evening. In doing so, we lift up Councilmember Roscoe, Councilmember Garcia, Councilmember Martinez, Deputy Mayor Garcia, and Mayor White. May they be granted peace and wisdom as they lead our city to a bright and prosperous future. Amen. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll call this meeting to order and do a quick roll call. Council Member Morosco? Present. Council Member Garcia? Here. Council Member Martinez? Present. Deputy Mayor Garcia? Here. And I, Mayor White, am here. No public report. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Uh, we'll move on to, sorry. Now, can you hear me? Perfect. We'll move on to non-agenda public comments. Yes. Our first speaker is Stephen Wheeler. Oh. That's Just a friendly reminder, there's three minutes for public comments, and right at three minutes, we're going to cut you off and move on to the next person. We have quite a few to get through tonight, so thank you. the repeal of our current cannabis business prohibition and the business rationale to proceed and to offer an increased level of community transparency as this is not I haven't found that we're working on this already for those not aware I have pre presented the City Council a file visually representing the fiscal benefits our sister city Vista has real over has realized excuse me over the last five years honorable mayor Thank you for your reply. <laughs> and I now better understand the mechanism for the path forward. Thank you for that, sir. I appreciate it. I do, however, direct to the council or maybe the mayor. I ask, however, how may I become informed of the working group's deliverables? As a project manager, I work my timelines backwards. This is where I end up with a deliverable. And I also start it with a charter. How can I, over some period of time, become aware of the working group's charter and deliverables? I also ask if that at some point, the working group welcomes direct community impact. I'm your guy. <laughs> and I would welcome the opportunity. For all I have or would like to have the presentation file I made available or just continue the conversation. I will make myself available after this meeting. Thank you for listening. And lastly, I want to direct my comment to you, sir, city manager, and Mr. McGlynn. I offer that something that you know way better than me, but I'm offering that this gentleman to my right, our city clerk, is outstanding public servant. And I wish a tip of the hat to you and your organization. Hope that makes it to the management. <laughs> thank you. Very kind, Mr. Wheeler, thank you. Our next comment is Malik Hadid. Some of you may uh, already see in some of my email. Um, the issue I have is um, back on July 10th, the city council approved 38% increase or $220,000. There was some shortfall in the budget for uh, fire prevention as a whole. Uh, so that was 38%. Uh, I think the slide that was uh, briefed by uh, Christina Holmes 
showed the number 62 on that slide. Uh, it was only one slide back on July 10th, like I said, uh, 2024. Uh, now, the, uh, we got our uh, fire inspection bill, and that was a 198% uh, increase. So somehow between the 38%, it shot up to 198%. Uh, there's a 60-page document uh, that is done by some kind of either subcontractor or dependent contractor. Uh, and then line, um, line 70 of page uh, 20, uh, shows that amount uh, that the inspection fee gone up to uh, by 198 percent for units three through ten. So, as a as a owner of a three unit complex uh, in Escondido, I'm the smallest landlord, but yet I got the highest increase. Now I'm okay with a 38 percent increase, but I'm not okay with a 198 percent increase. So I'm asking the city council to look into it. Uh, to look into that slide that was, um, you know, page 20 of the of the PDF file that was 60 pages long, and uh, uh, you know we need to separate um, three and four unit buildings from five and more or the larger buildings as maybe one of the solutions, and then the the then um, the bill that I received for 2024 uh, was postponed for some odd reason and they waited until the, uh, after the September 15 for the increase, and they sent me the new bill uh, with the higher amount versus, um, normally I do my inspection July, August time frame, so by the time September comes around, I'm already done, but this year for some reason they waited, so I got hit with the 388 for 24, not just starting from 25. So I have, I'm not sure if I'm allowed, but I have all my bullets on a couple of pieces of paper I can leave them with Zach, and uh, everything I've said is on here. And I appreciate the response. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I know, I think a couple of us may have forwarded this to you. I'm assuming staff is already aware and, and working on it. Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yep. Our next speaker, oh yeah, our next speaker is Wally Gutierrez. Hello, my name is Wally Gutierrez. I'm a proud citizen of Escondido for the last 62 years. I love my community. There's no, nothing better than Escondido until I got my water bill. On the 10th of October, I got my water bill, and it was for three, almost $300. And I said, $300? I guess it is, so I paid the $300. But it didn't sit right with me. So what I did is I went online and saw what my water bill was three months ago. It was $100.57. $100 Last month, it went to $157.79. And then this month, it went to 289.22. Something's wrong. So I said, what should I do? It said to call the number that's on the bill. I called the number, and I said, hey, my water bill's a little high. And the lady at the counter says, you're one of the lucky ones. I said, lucky ones? He says, yeah, a number of citizens, made, a number of citizens got a larger water bill because it was a, a computer glitch. I said, okay, so what are we gonna do about it? Well, we give you credit. Or I says, I just need to talk to it. Somebody that's in charge that could tell me what they're going to do. Okay, we'll get somebody to get back to you. About 20 minutes later, the lead of that department called me back and says, yep, we had a computer glitch. We're really sorry about it. You know, we're going to give you credit if you want credit because you've already paid the bill. I says, I'm fortunate that I can afford to pay the water bill. But there's a lot of citizens of Escondido that can't. And now they get a bill that's triple the size. There's something wrong. So then I said, well, they just need to let somebody know. I just want somebody to call me back and how they're going to deal with it. Mysteriously, the following Monday, there was a Facebook page from the city page. And it talked about 2,000 customers receiving a larger bill than normal. And that 6% of the citizens of Escondido, and they apologized. They also said that it was a clerical error. I'm told it was a computer glitch. Now I'm told it's a clerical glitch. We just, the citizens just need to know. I know a lot of you city council people. You guys have been to my house. I hear our new city manager's awesome. We're just asking you guys to do the right thing and get the department head to notify those 2,000 citizens what went wrong and what, the, and what they can do about paying the bill or overpaying the bill, what happens if they overpaid it. Just make the situation right. I have faith in you guys. I just didn't have any faith in staff because of the runaround I got. And like I said, I'm still waiting for a call. 
And I was one of the ones that were proactive. Just, just imagine the ones that are reactive, just waiting for that call. So I'm just doing this basically for the citizens of Escondido, and hopefully you guys will do the right thing. I believe this council will do the right thing, and I think our city manager will too. Thank you. Our next speaker is Greg Swiss. Council members, thank you for uh, taking some time to hear from us. Uh, my name is Greg Sawizdrazal. I'm the president for IOTSE Local 122. We represent all of the uh, theater operators at the CCAE. We're aware of the RFP process that has been going on, that is ongoing, uh, which is in process right now. There's going to be a subcommittee on it. Uh, and I'm asking uh, or urging uh, any of the members that are sitting on that uh, committee to consider the workers that work in that facility. We've got a ton of members that have come through that facility. Uh, we have a brand new apprenticeship program that has been based off of the internship that has been built in that uh, facility. And uh, this RFP process has the potential to risk their jobs. And I just want to make sure that you know how important that facility is to myself. I'm one of the people that went through there as well as a lot of the members that we have here today that work in, in, in that building. So when you guys make the decision that you make, I hope that you can consider the people that work there, my members and members of your community. And thank you. Our next speaker is Samantha McLaughlin. <coughs> Good evening, Mayor White. Council members, my name is Samantha McLaughlin. Tonight, I wanted to address the RFP for new operations management at the California Center for the Arts. Tonight, I stand before you as a product of this current structure at the CCE. I started working there as a young intern in the technical theater department. I was 18 years old and barely made it through high school, having been orphaned and unhoused in my early teens. I was looking for purpose and a home. I grew as a person and as a professional, learning more than I thought possible, gaining friendships that are more like family and relationships I still have to this day. Within a couple of years of working as an intern, I was able to join IOTC Local 122 because of their relationship and training program at the CCE. This opened up possibilities I never had before, and I invested all I learned back into the center. I began to oversee the intern program I once was a student of, becoming the Associate Technical Director in 2013. The career and life I was able to cultivate at the CCE would not have been possible in any other space. The position I hold now at UC San Diego would not have been possible without the guidance and support of the Center for the Arts. And this story is not unique to me. The CCE has stood as a beacon in Escondido to kids like me looking for direction and growth, for a community in need and of an escape into the arts, for hundreds of locals who are looking for jobs, livable wages, and security. The CCE isn't just a space for the arts or the community. It is, as its name infers, the center for the community. A change in operations could put hundreds of people out of work and thousands of community members in Escondido and North County as a whole without a place to go on July 4th, Day of the Dead, or the Winter Wonderland celebration. I urge you, Mr. Mayor, and members of City Council to show the leadership your, constitu your constituents entrusted to you, the employees who work there, and the employees like me who needed a place to call home. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amber Steinbeck. Hello, Mayor White and Council members. I am here once again to address the request for proposal for management rights at the California Center for the Arts and the impact that being managed simply for profit will have on the wonderful community of Escondido. The Center for the Arts is not a building. It is the beating heart of a vibrant community. Over the course of my 14 years, which I celebrated my anniversary two weeks ago at the Center, in many different positions, I have watched this community grow up. I have helped little kids get over their stage fright during their first dance recital. I have talked with middle and high school students as they looked around with wonder while they got their chance to perform for the first time on a professional stage with a professional crew. I have seen people graduate after going back to school in their adult life and heard about their struggles. I have watched countless teenagers cry after performing their senior dance just to see them come back the next year during an alumni performance. My own 20-year-old assistant performed their eighth grade band show on our concert hall stage, and although that performance I did not work, several people in this room did. I have been a part of countless weddings, proms, art exhibits, quinceaneras, freak events, 
that I can count, moments that members of this community hold dear to their heart. The fact that the RFP does not require school partnership, IOTC partnership, the internship program, or community events to continue, regardless of its manager, is frankly insulting to this community, which I have been a part of my entire life. The Center for the Arts is a safe space, space built by the community for the community. And I once again implore this council not to let the heart of Escondido get bled dry for profit or for personal gain. Thank you. Speaker is Marco Briones. Good evening, Mayor White and council members and city staff. Thank you very much. My name is Marco Briones. I'm the political director of the San Diego and Imperial Counties Labor Council. We proudly represent over 135 different unions and 200,000 working families across these regions, including here in Escondido. I'm here today to address the RFP as well, and we're here today in good faith because our members, as you can tell, are very proud to work in Escondido. These are good paying career jobs that stagehands do with tremendous care and pride. We're glad that at present our elected leaders uh, who manage the city budget are the same elected representatives that we have that now make the ultimate say on how the CCA operates. Should that operator change, we simply ask that you remain open to hearing what these workers have to say. These members want to continue to work and live in this condito. These jobs provide livable wages and an opportunity to achieve the American dream. Please protect these jobs. We want to continue making Escondido a destination for the arts. And thank you for your consideration. Our next speaker is Jake Estrada. Good afternoon, City Council. My name is Ansetamil Jake Estrada. I'm the political director for the San Diego Building and Construction Trades Council. We have around 35,000 members across this county. Uh, trade unionists, uh, and I'm proud to be here and stand on behalf of, uh, stand with uh, our siblings represented by Yahtzee 122. Uh, public venues, uh, public facilities for that matter, should deliver high quality jobs to our communities. Public institutions like this facility should be monuments to public service, not a mechanism to undercut working people of this community. Uh, I urge you all to really look at what delivers the largest public benefit to Escondido. Uh, this facility is a pillar of the arts in North County. That value and that benefit does not exist without labor. No value exists without labor. So I urge you, uh, I urge you and my members urge you to support these works, to support this community and support the arts in Escondido. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nathan Herrenstein. Uh, my name is Nathan Herrenstein, uh, Mayor White, Council Member, City Staff. I appreciate you taking the time out to listen to us today. Um, last week, I presented the the fact that the California Center for the Arts at Escondido is the signatory for the first uh, federally recognized apprenticeship and sponsorship with the OTSI that has existed. I told you what we were doing, and now I need to tell you why it works and why it's important. Our industry is amazingly fast paced. We build cities in three days. We pull up houses that just the fronts of them or maybe even the backs or the sides. We build sets, we build uh, facilities, we create temporary power structures. This leaves very little time to train. These things have to come up fast and every moment that's there, every moment that's spent is about the money that, it, that goes into that production. California Center for the Arts, through its mandate, through its community process, opened up a space in the internship where a person could see how that functions and have the room to grow and learn. They have the ability to internalize the culture and the aspects of the show must go on and everything that we do in an industry and actually have the space to become the professionals they need to be. It has been phenomenally successful. Uh, as I said last time, we have department heads in, the, in uh, the Civic Theater, the Old Globe Theater, the La Jolla Playhouse, every single hotel that goes downtown, the convention center. We build shop, things in the opera shop. We are in several build shops throughout the county. We work with show imaging, encore, in-house. We basically provide 
live events for the entire county. And in this instance, most of the leadership that has come through, or a greater majority of it, it has come through this program in some way, shape, or form. Some directly through the internship, some through the leadership training that we basically unofficially built here. Half of the executive board at ATSI 122 is from this program. The secretary treasurer is from this program. You heard from the president who's from this program. So when you talk to the people who are going to oversee this RFP, when you talk to that, when that committee exists, I want, you, I want you to make sure that they understand that you're not just, you don't just hold in your hand 30 years of history. You don't just hold in your hand somebody else's job. You hold in your hand the leadership and future of live events and entertainment in this county because we have made that much of an impact. And like I said last time, you should be proud and you should really, really support this. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Morales. Honorable Mayor, City Council members, distinguished guests, it's an honor to stand and uh, wrap this up. You've heard the personal testimonies from the, uh, the members, of course, in the workforce. I want to make sure that you're aware as the business agent of IOTC Local 122, my name's Robert Morales again. We represent workers, a large workforce, over 1,500 members that we're dispatching. It could be weekly. Uh, every worker is important. It's all about the workforce and the jobs within this community. So I wanted to make sure when you're making your consideration, you think about the workers. And I thank you for hearing everyone this evening. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mary Pirucci. Good evening. My name is Mary Pirucci. I have lived in Escondido for 45 years. Um, I was at the celebration the night that the uh, CCA opened. Um, it's really a very special place to live. Um, when this was on the ballot in 1985, there was no thought that it was not going to be forever. So I think you have to consider that. When we voted for this, we thought it would always be here. Um, we have a one cent uh, increase on the ballot this time. Hopefully that will get passed. And if there's no theater in Escondido, Older people will not drive at night 25 miles back and forth to go to a theater. Also, young people really need to develop and appreciate the arts. It changes who you are. Uh, we are the only museum, as far as I know, a fine arts museum in Escondido. I've taught at the university, and the 150 employees that you have here are very special. That's not the way most young people are. I would like you to consider that it's your duty to the community to continue this. Um, there's something very special about this, and it can't be measured in dollars and cents. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leah Lixota. Leah, and my apologies if I just in, <laughs> incorrectly pronounce your last name, Thank I'm so you. sorry. My name is Leah Pichotu, the owner of Laurel Glen Boutique at 158 East Grand Avenue at the corner of Calmia and Grand. I want to let everyone know that I'm not opposed to the construction to improve the downtown business on Grand Avenue, just not at the holiday season. Mayor White, on his interview with CBS 8 News on October 9th, said there was no good timing to shut down a street. I feel that simply is not so. It's all in the timing. The holiday season is vital for a business to thrive. No one could have imagined that the city would do such a massive construction during this time. So January would have been a much better start date. According to the Escondido Times Advocate dated September 9th, 2021, in phase one of the construction, the city did ask the business if they wanted to wait until after the holiday season. 
They chose to do just that. We were not given a choice, nor did we know until two weeks before the construction was to start. There is 12 months in a year. The work will be continuing way into 2025. So January could have been a possibility, but I truly believe the timing was to satisfy the cruising grant event, as I mentioned the last time I was here at this podium. All the businesses in downtown area are different. Some will survive, some are already closing, some will close at a later date due to how each business functions. For example, hairdressers work off of appointments. We build up an inventory in the third quarter for the holiday season amounting to thousands of dollars. If we can't sell the merchandise in the fourth quarter, we are doomed. The city is supposed to serve the people, the community, and local businesses. The DBA does not speak for me or for Urban Barn or for many of the businesses downtown. So I ask all of you to do the right thing. Approve a grant for those of us who will need assistance to get through six more months of construction, culminating into a major loss of business and closing down. Yes, timing matters. Major White also said, I'm not saying that's not a possibility, meaning grants. I think that's something the council would need to be discussed. Well, has there been any discussions? No one on the board has come to see my shop or speak to me concerning the possibilities of grants. I ask you guys, all of you, do the right thing. I want to keep my business. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robin Sion. Hi, my name is Robin Scow. My husband Steve and I have owned and operated Urban Barn located at 404 East Grand Avenue for 10 years and we love being a part of Escondido. Our store houses approximately 40 vendors who rent their spots for us to sell their items. So essentially we have 40 small businesses under one roof. I would like to speak today about the impact construction has had and continues to have on our business. We have experienced the trauma of construction for years now surrounding our building from the assisted living on Ivy, to the hospital being torn down, to the apartments replacing the hospital, and now the massive construction down Grand. My vendors and I were so disheartened to see the construction down Grand. Many of them have con confessed concern to me about how they will make it through the next seven months. The timing couldn't come at a worse time. We do approximately 40% of our yearly business during the months of October, November, and December. The road closure and construction has already affected our October sales. Last October at this time, we sold $28,441, and as of today, we are at $17,272. That is a 40% decrease. That kind of loss can be detrimental, especially when looking at seven more months of grand construction. I want to give you a few figures so you can hear how construction around a store greatly impacts sales for the worse. In 2021, our year to date was $610,000. In 2022, which was the COVID year, and we had to shut down for two and a half months, we did $532,000. That was, we shut down without any sales during that time. In 2023, we started having mass construction and we did $435,000. This year so far, we are at $275,000 from $610,000. So it's a huge, in 2021, so that's a huge decrease in sales. Although the grand improvement construction is not directly in front of our building, it impacts our business directly. Our parking is being taken by hours for people going up the street to eat. We have also had two customers' cars hit by the increased traffic going down Ivy, two accidents in three weeks. We are not against improvement on grand. I've been waiting for years for this. I think the concept is awesome and will make grand a great destination to visit, eat, eat and shop but I am completely against the timing of it. It is horrible for retail and puts my shop and my 40 vendors in jeopardy of closing, especially impacting these vital sales months. I have vendors, if I have vendors leave because of low sales, I have no way to pay my bills or my rent. Please consider a grant for businesses impacted by construction on Grand. I love Escondido and like to stay a part of this community for many years to come, but I am not sure that can happen without a grant and cooperation consideration from the city of Escondido. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mitchell Doral. And I apologize, is that regarding homeless encampments? Oh, I'm so sorry. Mike, my apologies. Yeah. You guys got a lot of encampments. Yeah. 
So I'm going to add one more. Um, I live off of real close to Citro Cotto Extension, and I didn't know this, but when they opened up that Citro Cotto Extension, there is about two to 300 homeless people living down there. It is just one tent city after another. We've had two helicopters over there in the last two months searching for criminals. Um, these, these, these homeless are just out of control in Escondido, and they're not safe for our community. They're stealing from the Albertsons that's right next to my, my, the one I shop at. I've talked to all the ladies. I've been there for 18 years. They're stealing shopping carts. They're stealing from Home Depot. Home Depot's had to put up in basically like a huge uh, fence line around all of their rental equipment now. It's out of control. What are we doing to fix this? They, they're, they're just doing whatever they want to do. And I've called the police four or five different times in the last six months. They have literally told me there's nothing they can do. There's nothing they can do. Their hands are tied. What bills can we pass? How can we get rid of these, these individuals? I understand some of these people are down on luck, but most of them are drug addicts. Most of them are thieves. You know, a lot of them are just straight up criminals, but yet we're letting them just run across our city and do whatever they want to do. I mean, why can't they clear up that encampment down there? It's just a matter of time before somebody gets raped, you know, assaulted. I, things are getting stolen left and right. It's, it's just, it's obvious. And yet we're just sitting around doing nothing. Why don't the police have the authority to arrest these people, put them in jail? They've wasted a lot of time from the police that need to be handling better matters. They've wasted all kinds of firefighters time. I, I, I'm a home inspector. I speak with homes. I, I speak with firefighters. I do their inspections. I've been an inspector for 20 years. They spend at least 30% of their time just on homeless people. This, we've got to do something about this. We've got to fix it. It's for the safety of our community. It's for the safety of where I live. I literally live just a thousand feet away from there. I've got my mail stolen. People's cars are getting broken into constantly. Again, um, let me check my notes here, make sure I didn't miss anything. Ugh. I, I urge you guys to really sit down together and just figure out what we can do about these encampments. What can we do about these homeless? Again, these are not the homeless of 20 years ago, where they just kept to themselves and didn't do anything. These people are stealing from our communities, robbing from people's cars, you know, trashing our neighborhoods. They've, they've left all kinds of trash down that entire area. It's going to take four or five dumpsters to clear that area out. And why can't we clear it out? That's what I'm asking you. Why can't we clear it out? Um, other than that, these people lack respect for our community, and they lack respect for everybody around them. And, and we need to, I mean, I'd rather pay to have them sit in jail than, than to have them just disrespect everybody in our communities. Other than that, thank you for my time. Did you leave your contact information with the clerk? Um, I did, but I didn't write it very well because I typed will you, everything. Will you include I, your phone number in that? And yeah. I will give you a very long, thorough update on that situation and what we're doing. Thank you, sir. I'll give you a call tomorrow. Appreciate it. No further oral communications. Are we allowed to say vote yes on 36 or... Or no, okay, I'm just asking. <laughs> if not, I'll say it on the phone tomorrow. Is there any other public comments? None. Okay, perfect. All right, we'll move on to our consent calendar. Items one through seven are on consent. Um, I move to approve the consent calendar as is. Perfect. Motion second. Please open the voting. Voting is open. At the end of the meeting, yeah. Just make sure you fill out a speaker slip. Do you have a speaker slip? No. Oh. Hey, Mayor White, you might, it looks like your vote didn't register. Thanks, Michael. Motion approved 5 0. There we go. Uh, that moves us on to public hearings, which uh, the first one is a short form rent increase application for a carefree ranch mobile home park. And I will go ahead and open the public hearing and turn the time over to staff for presentation. Good evening, members of the Rent Review Board. My name is Danielle Lopez. I'm the Housing and Neighborhood Services Manager. With me is Carlos Cervantes. He's our new management analyst over Mobile Home Park um, 
reviews and um, rent applications, and Code Compliance Officer Stephen Jacobson. For your consideration this evening is a short form rent increase application for Carefree Ranch Mobile Home Park. The board is asked to receive this presentation, hear public testimony, and make a determination concerning the rent increase request in accordance with the factors set forth in the Escondido Mobile Home Rent Control Ordinance and Mobile Home Rent Review Board Guidelines. Staff is recommending approval of the short form mobile home rent increase application and adoption of the rent review board resolution number 2024-140. At this time, I will turn it over to Carlos and Stephen to provide the presentation. Thank you, Danielle. Hi. Thank you, Danielle. So on June 8th, 1988, Escondido residents voted to approve Proposition K to enact mobile home rent control in the city of Escondido. Under Prop K, if a park owner wants to increase the rent of a mobile home rent control space, they must file an application with the city to obtain approval from the Mobile Home Rent Review Board. In 1997, the board adopted changes to the Mobile Home Rent Review Board guidelines to allow for the acceptance of a short form application. The short form is an abbreviated and less administratively burdensome application process for park owners and city staff. Through a short form application, a park owner can request an increase based solely on the change in the San Diego Metropolitan Area's Consumer Price Index, CPI, versus a long form that takes several factors into consideration, including change in CPI, local rent comparisons, capital improvements, changes in property tax, changes in utility costs, and changes in operating and, maintain and maintenance expenses. As you know, the short form guidelines were recently updated. However, this application was received and deemed complete prior to that update, so the old guidelines will be used for this application. In order to be eligible for a short form, it has to have been at least 12 months since the last rent increase application was deemed complete. The park owner's request to, has requested to apply 100% of the rent control space in the park. And the request the requested increase may not exceed 90% of the increase in CPI since the last application was granted by the board, or 8% of the current rent, whichever is less. Thank you. Right. Carefree Ranch is a 55 and, age, 55 and up age park. The last increase was approved August 23rd, 2023 for an average increase of $37.95 per rent controlled space. The CPI for time period consideration was 6.56% from December 31st, 2021 to December 31st, 2022. Park anemones are accessible to all residents and include a clubhouse renovated in 2018, a pool, jacuzzi, and laundry room, and a gym area, pool tables, and library with reading area. Here we have a summary of the park's request. This request covers a 12 month period of consideration. As I said before, the last increase was approved August 23rd, 2023, with an average increase of $37.95 per space per month. The park is currently requesting the maximum allowable increase of 90% in the change in CPI, which equates to 4.275%. The average rent control space is currently $652.23. The average requested increase is $26.74, with increases ranging from $19.92 to $35.70. The resident meeting was held on September 9th at 6 p.m. Individual notices were sent to each resident affected by this request notifying them of the rent increase application, the resident meeting, and the public hearing date. Residents voiced concerns about general difficulty exiting the park onto Citrus Ave due to high volumes of traffic and speeding cars, as well as concerns regarding increase in cost of living in general. The park manager educated the residents on the renter's assistance program, and Lester Dale Anderson was appointed rep resident representative. Since the resident meeting, we have received no emails or phone calls regarding the concerns about the increase. Additionally, no residents have signed in to protest the increase today. At this time, I will turn it over to Stephen to cover the code compliance inspections. Stephen, I think you might need to turn your microphone on. I'm so sorry. It, it should turn green when you press the button and hold it. Is it better now? 
Thank you. Sorry to Good evening, Council and Mayor. On September 9th, a lighting inspection was performed by the Code Compliance Division. No lighting violations were identified. On September 10th, an inspection of the common areas was conducted by Code Compliance Division and Park Management. Two general park violations were identified. The park had overgrown branches on spaces 11, 110, 246, and 250, along with a missing latch on the rear gate to the trash bin enclosure. A notice was mailed to the park manager and owner informing of them of the violations. According to the Mobile Home Rent Review Board guidelines, no increase granted for any park shall go into an effect until any existing code violations are corrected. A reinspection was conducted and as of October 3rd, 2024, all violations were corrected. Attempted contact with Park Rep Representative Dale Anderson was made on October 4th and October 17th. The Park Representative contacted Code Compliance Division on October 18th with no inspection complaints. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So in summary, this application meets the eligibility criteria for submittal of a short form rent increase request. Staff is recommending approval of the short form mobile home rent increase application and adoption of the rent review board number 2024-140. This concludes the presentation and we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Dale Anderson is president as a design designated rep resident representative. Jim Younce is president as an owner's representative as well. Thank you. Um, do we normally have the park rep representative or the renter's representative? Yeah, generally the park representative goes first. Perfect. Time is yours, sir. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. I'm Jim Yance, and I'm the resident manager of Carefree Ranch and represent Thompson Properties, who manages the property. Uh, here to any, answer any questions that you might have. I, I do want to underscore uh, the, something that came up in our resident meeting that comes up with our residents all the time, and that is traffic on Citrus Avenue. Uh, we're seniors. We're coming in and out of a park. We have an uh, apartment complex right across the way. Lots of school traffic. Um, I would love to see those uh, leave this intersection clear markings on either side of the two driveways who are facing each other. If that's something that you guys would consider or put in somebody's hands, uh, I know every resident at Care for Your Ranch would appreciate that. Any questions you might have for me? Thank, um, thank you for bringing that up because I had that highlighted in the report and I was wondering mm -hmm. um, if staff was taking that to the traffic division to make a note of it. I don't know if that's been captured, but that would be great for them to know that. Yeah, we emailed them and let them know about the complaint and we're just waiting for a follow-up to see how we'll, we will handle that. Thank you for doing that. And then just, um, I, I, I did hear um, that you all have a renter assistance program. Can you share what that is? Okay, so uh, we have an assistance program for homeowners that uh, uh, for whatever reason get into trouble, can't pay the rent. Often it's because a spouse has died and they're down to one social security amount. Uh, it's, you know, thrown them for a loop. Uh, could be health things. It could be a variety of things. So um, if they can't get assistance other places, and we do try to help people get assistance, then the park itself will help. Um, I have, I think, three residents receiving assistance right now. So, um, uh, and I have another application to process. So they come to my office, uh, they basically have to show us what their situation is, and uh, we'd like to keep our residents in the park. So uh, Bart Thompson, the owner, uh, does this in order to do that, and we do it at our other properties in town as well. There's an application process, mm -hmm. and, the, and, and you partner with agencies, or you, you know, help people refer them to possible agencies? Well, I, I try to, to refer people if I know that there's some program someplace that might fit them, uh, but, but the park assistance program is from Bart Thompson. Gotcha. He's doing it as the owner. Okay. 
Got it. And is that like just, you know, a, a break on the fees or a payment um, plans? I'm just curious what that looks like. Well, um, 150 bucks a month uh, credit for okay. a couple of them, a little less for the third one. But, um, you know, so somebody's run into trouble and we don't want them to lose their home. Okay. If we can help keep them in there, particularly if they've lived with us for 20 or 30 years. Understood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I'd like to piggyback off that. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I think what you're doing is great. I know we've talked about it before. Um, I've helped navigate certain people in my HOA as well through the process, and it's not just assistant uh, rental assistant programs, but uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. But if not, I would recommend um, looking into different um, cost saving programs. You know, you could do fair or care through SDG&E. Mm -hmm. There's other ones. Um, you know, I've referred to the some people through to food pantries there's different programs around the city around the county that i think would be beneficial um, i know it helped a couple of my residents quite a bit so i'm sure you're already doing that but just in case anybody's listening there are other options as well but these programs kind of pop up and disappear sometimes really fast i i uh, can't think of the name of it heard of one uh, a couple weeks ago uh, and just found out that they've already closed taking applications so it's like okay well Sure. Uh, so we keep our eyes open for that kind of thing, and you know, if we can help folk, we'll help folk. Thank you. Quest quick question. So people leaving the facility can turn left, correct? It's not just right turn only on the exit? No, we can turn right and left. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, um, there's a red mark curb I don't know how many feet from the entrance on the Carefree Ranch side of the street, uh, but then there's, you got about three parking spaces between us and the Vaughn's Shopping Center uh, that you can't see. If there's a high profile vehicle parked there, you know, you're, you're, you're taking a risk every time you pull. And I drive a Ford Explorer, I'm sitting up, and I've almost been hit. Uh, more than once and it seems to me that you almost got hit trying to pull out of there too so um, it's not just because we have some uh, shaky drivers it's it's a excuse me it's a it's a difficult intersection particularly when school traffic's moving uh, in the morning and then late in the afternoon thank you Okay. Thank you. That concludes that part. Thank you, sir. Mr. Anderson. Uh, resident representative, yes. I'm coming. Is there a, uh, another microphone we can give him so he doesn't have to say? Ooh, I, I offered previously. He preferred okay. to come to the front. Perfect. I just have a few little problems. called going to war and coming home. <laughs> Hi, Mayor and Council. My name is Dale Anderson. I'm here to speak on behalf of 58 residents that are in the park. I, when I, when I spoke with, with this team, my plan was to talk to each resident and find out some information about them and what they're doing and how they're doing it. The problem is I spent the last two and a half weeks in the hospital at the VA. So I didn't get the opportunity to talk to as many people, but I've talked to a few. This is a senior park loaded with senior people. Most senior people are on fixed incomes. And in the last two years, the park has asked for uh, over $50 per residence for additional rent. Now, they have not built a new pool. They have not built a new hot tub. They have not built a new clubhouse. They have not, the only thing that I have seen that they have spent money on is solar 
for the electricity in the facility. There's very few people in the park that use any of the items that I've mentioned. They also have, uh, God, I forget what it is. Anyway, but nobody, go, nobody goes up there to play games. People stay at home in our park. Some of them don't work. Some of them do. But the majority of the senior citizens with this rent increase are going to go broke. The one thing, a couple things that I've read about is that last year the council gave the park about a $36 increase average. I did not come up and speak. Nobody from the park came up to speak. They didn't even come up to sign up, just come here and watch what's going on. They don't want to. They're not really, how do I put this? They don't want to do anything that's going to get them in trouble. Now, Jim is a great manager. I've liked him for a number of years that I've been there. He has a problem with me, which we won't talk about at this point, but he does have a major problem. But we are trying to work it out, and that's what's nice. But for the park to ask for these kind of increases, over 6% last year, another almost 5% this year. From a, from a pocket major money standpoint, it's hurting the residents. And I read something in a paper that I have that the park can, is not supposed to file for an increase until after a year. Last year, they increased the rent on November 1st of 2024. We have already received letters that our rent will increase on November 1st of this year, which is in a couple weeks. I am strongly recommending to you guys that you think about the senior citizens. Do not allow this increase. They got over 6% last year. And they filed, in my opinion, based on what I read, they have filed too early to ask for another rent increase. They sent the, their application on the 17th of October. And they sent us letters that our rent was going to increase on November 1st on October 22nd. So they know or they think that this council and this mayor is going to just let them do what they want without considering the people that live there. Thank you. Anybody have a question for me? Um, thank you for, for showing up. Not, we don't always get residents that come to our meetings, so I appreciate that even with all that, you know, being in the hospital, I'm, I'm glad you're doing better and you're here, um, that you took the time to be here. So I know it's, it's, a, it's difficult sometimes to get here. Um, you mentioned the October, you were noticed about the rent, and it says here, park management must give 90-day notice. 
So I'm just curious is the, um, can, if, I'm curious as to the um, noticing of the proposed, how that works, um, whether you have to let, I know you have to let them know in advance that you're wanting to increase the rent so that they know and there's a public hearing so that they have advance notice to attend that and then they know of this hearing. Is that different from the 90 day notice? Um, I, I, from some of the documents here that I've read, I believe what it says, in my opinion, is that they can't file, they can't raise the rent until after the council approves it. And then it's 90 days from that portion. Last year, it was a couple weeks after you approved the 6.7 something. Uh, okay. So can we get clarity on the yes. I was gonna say, let me let me close the public hearing and then I was gonna ask some questions about that very thing about the process. Okay. So thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll close the public hearing portion of that. Um, but to Council Member Martinez question, so can we get a couple of things qu clarified? The one year notice of when the rent was increased the last time and then how the 90 day notice works. Is that 90 days from when the council approves it or 90 days before the actual increase goes into effect? So for, to answer the first question, the application, the application last year was approved by council on August 23rd, which, and they applied this year, um, what was the date this year, Carlos? This year, they were, they were past their one year time frame for this year for turning in their application. Um, regarding the 90 days, um, I have to look at the rent review board guidelines. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have those in front of me. I, I know that it speaks to giving a 90 day donus. I just can't say for certain whether that's 90 days from the date of approval from the rent review board or 90 days from um, just 90 day notice in general. Okay. Um. I was actually just about to call you up here, Mr. Anderson. I had some follow-up questions for you as well. No. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's okay. um, I'm not a lawyer. I don't pretend to be one, but uh, our understanding of uh, the California MRLs is that we have to give a 90-day notice prior to a rent increase. We expect that rent increase to take place on November 1st. That's the renewal month for everybody that's in this process. It happens every year on November 1st, unless something here changes that. Um, so by law, we sent that letter out uh, before August 1st so that residents knew it was coming up. There have been notices from the city as well, and I think Dale has those. So if he's talking about a notice he received in October, that's probably from the housing office saying that this hearing is taking place. Uh, if you guys say there's no increase, then we can't enact the increase. You, you have to approve it first. But um, our understanding of the law is we have to put that notice out 90 days prior, and we've done that. And then once, uh, once it's approved here or disapproved, then uh, we can enact it the next day. Because there's nothing that I've read um, in the Prop K material that says that you have to be 90 days out from the approval. It's just that you have to approve before it can enact it. Okay, and then um, I am just curious on some follow-up about what he mentioned as far as the pool and the jacuzzi and the clubhouse. What have been the conversations about renovating or updating those things? Oh, well, the pool's probably going to get refinished this year because it's, uh, it's due for it, but um, they're nice amenities, so we keep them up. Uh, there's a lot of people that use them. Dale used to use the jacuzzi uh, more than anybody. Yeah. True? Yeah. I did. Yeah. Did, did we keep it nice and hot and clean? Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. happy okay. with it. So okay. um, not, not everybody in any community uses all the stuff that's there, but it's there for them. Understood. Thank you. That concludes my questions for now. Councilmember Martinez, if you wanted to yeah. keep going with yours, go ahead. Yes, and then just, uh, does our city attorney have anything to chime in about the 90 days, just to make sure we're, I know we don't have that um, 
in front of us now, but if that, what, what triggers that 90 days? Right. It, it, it is a function of just the notice that's given and before that rent increase can take place. So if you look at, for example, the resident notice of public hearing, which was sent on October 11th, the very last sentence, says if an increase is granted, this is our letter, if an increase is granted, the owner must notify you in writing of the amount of the increase at least 90 days before the increase goes into effect. So what they did was they gave notices to the requested amount, I assume. Mm -hmm. I've seen your notice, but yeah. this is ours. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I agree with and, the, and we do. I agree and with we, the park representative. Yeah. We do that uh, when we filed with the city. Um, usually the process is a little quicker than it was this year because of people getting situated in new jobs perfectly fine Smaller but uh, so normally we apply in June or July and we're I'm here to see you in July or August and this is not an issue but uh, this year it was a little different okay. and that's okay but we did uh, our paperwork as needed yeah and then just one thing because I never like approving the rent increase you know that no, I mean, no one likes the rent does. to go up I don't up. think anyone likes doing that yeah um, City Attorney, I, you know, we have these two processes, right? We have the short term and the long term, and the the uh, the short term and the and the and the long form. Short form. Yes, form. <laughs> so, um, you know, and the 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 reason of the short form, from my understanding, and I wanted the City Attorney to chime in, is that it's that um, when you go the short term, short form, excuse me, route, it is. Pretty much saying, you know, you know, an annual increase is coming, which you know, no one looks forward to, but it, it it makes it a lot lesser amount than if you were to go through a long form, which could, you know, doesn't have the same cap as the short mm -hmm. form. So, so that the, there is like this assumption that these, that's the benefit of going this route is that you are pretty much if you meet all the um, inspection criteria and you don't have any, have any outstanding issues on the properties that you are eligible to get this um, you know increase and I know it's tied to to um, the CPI right so whether you do short form or long form prop K guides all of your uh, and, uh, all of your considerations here in the case of the short form the idea behind that was to allow for a presumption that a 90% of the CPI would be fair just and reasonable and that's the same, that fair, just, and reasonable is the same marker that you're using in the long form application. But as you just said, the long form application is a much more complicated process that we have a consultant come in, they go through all of the 104 G factors, 102 or 104 G factors, which is that 11 non-exclusive list. Here, you look at the CPI only, you make a finding, pres you presume that is fair, just, and reasonable, and then there can be a downward adjustment, and then you would go back to the 104G uh, factor. So hopefully that helps. And that, so that triggers a different process, right? Well, no, you're still in the short form process. You could go and downward adjust off the 90%, but you'd have to make some findings in those 104G factors. Okay. Thank you. So just, just because I, I, I know, you know, I, I, I don't like voting for the increases, but nobody it is that, likes it the is, rent to it go is up. That I don't annual, either. <laughs> you know that it's coming annually, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, I just wanted to make that distinction because I think you know we do hear the same concerns every year, right? It's like a lot, you know, seniors and many people are on fixed incomes and and wages aren't keeping pace with the cost of living, and so it's it's a it's a big challenge. And so I'm very sensitive to that. So just wanted to share that. Thank you. Am I good? I think you are for now. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, all my questions were, were asked, so thank you very much. Um, and yeah, I don't like rent increases either. I received them and uh, not too happy about it. Um, but uh, it's uh, something that they're following the uh, short form. And, uh, and I wasn't, I, I had it, I did not have the understanding that if we downward adjust, we need to make a finding. You would, because you're presuming that it's fair, just, and reasonable at 90%. In order to vary from that presumption, they would have to rebut it. The, in this case, the residents would be rebutting the, that presumption, and you'd have to make those findings under 104G. Okay, so um, 
it's already established that at that point it is uh, fair, just, and reasonable. It's presumed it's to be, presu and it's there. It's a rebuttable presumption based on the, those factors. Thank you. Thank you for that clarity. Nothing. Okay. Well, then, with that being said, thank you. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I think with everything that was just discussed, I'm. Uh, I'm going to recommend or move to approve uh, the increase as currently recommended by staff and would ask for a second. I have a motion, second. Any other discussion or questions? Please open the voting. Voting is open. Motion approved, 5 0. Thank you again. That takes us to. Item nine. And Mr. Mayor, did you want to have a- Oh, yeah, right uh, Angel, go ahead. Come up, you've got three minutes to uh, invite everybody three to- Three big minutes or small minutes? <laughs> three. Okay, hi, my name is Angel Aguilar, and uh, this is uh, just an invitation for all of you guys to come participate on, at our next community event, is Tamale Festival. I know um, everybody's wanting to have this event. After, since the last one was in 2019, but uh, one of the issues I want to present to you guys is we inviting the Dukes uh, as a um, car club, and we would like to have them at, at the Tamal Festival. But last time when I was talking with the um, um, community uh, service, they said we can, we're not allowed to bring cars in the park. So I want, I want to introduce you to them, and I want to tell you guys why it's important to have them at the festival. Uh, Marisa and Alfredo. Good evening, council members. My name is Marisa Rosales. I'm a member of Duke's Car Club. Uh, the reason why I'm here is to let you know that lowriders are not like the stereotype that is portrayed in Hollywood. The lowrider culture is about family, giving back to the community, and empowering the youth. Lowrider clubs throughout the county participate in numerous outreach efforts year round whether it be fundraising for families in crisis, sending kids to sixth grade camps, backpack drives, Thanksgiving dinner giveaways, sponsoring families for the, for the Christmas holiday, or just taking our cars to display at schools or juvenile halls uh, and talking to the youth and giving them encouraging words. Um, Pre-COVID, Duke's Car Club had been participating in the Tamal Festival for several years, exhibiting our cars, talking to the families that, who approached us, asking questions. My hope is that this council continues to allow Duke's Car Club to give back to the city and community of Escondido by continuing the tradition of having the cars displayed at the, at the Tamal Festival. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Can we have somebody follow up on that? Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Angel. I noticed that I have three more minutes. No. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, uh, I will, I'm going to pass some of these flyers to you guys and I would like to see you guys on November 2nd. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I'll be there, for sure. Uh, that brings us to item nine, which is a hearing for Quint Street Senior Apartments. We'll open the public hearing. Sorry. <laughs> okay, good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name's Danielle Lopez. I'm the Housing and Neighborhood Services Manager. With me uh, this evening is Norma O'Keen, Management Analyst over our Home and Affordable Housing Programs. Tonight, Norma will be presenting on the Quinn Street Senior Housing Project and seeking your approval for the issuance of bonds under the TEFRA law. So tonight we'll be asking you to conduct a public hearing and adopt resolution number 2024-144, approving the issuance of revenue bonds by the California Municipal Finance Authority to finance or refinance the acquisition, construction, improvement, and equipping of a senior multifamily rental housing project located at 220 North Quince Street. We'll also be asking you to adopt resolution number 2024 for 145, approving the assumption of an existing regulatory agreement between the city and the San Diego Interfaith Housing Foundation. 
Um, not to be confused with Interfaith Community Services, Interfaith Community Housing Foundation is an affordable housing developer based out of Lemon Grove. Um, at this point, I will turn this over to Norma to, prevent the, uh, to present the additional information. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor White and City. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor White um, and City Council. My name is Norma Olkin. I am the Home Management Analyst for the City of Escondido. The Quince Senior Project is located at 220 North Quince Street. Previously, the Beacons property, if you're a little bit um, familiar with Escondido, is right across the street from the Transit Center. Um, this project will include 145 units dedicated to senior housing for residents aged 55 and older, with up to three units reserved for property management staff. On November 6, 2019, City Council approved Ordinance Number 2019-12R, which enabled the development of the 145 affordable senior housing units in the Gateway Transit District of Escondido's Downtown Specific Plan. If you take a look at this picture right here, this is a visual representation of how the project will look at the corner of Valley and Quince. This slide highlights the illuminated R panel installed in the southwest corner, corner of the building. These panels serve both as an artistic feature and as a functional safety element by improving the neighborhood's lighting and visual appeal. This slide here, um, what you will see right here is will be what, if you were driving or coming from the West Valley Parkway, the second picture to the right will actually show you the context with the surrounding building units that are already in place. This next picture right here shows um, what it will look like along Quince Street. Now, all this is wonderful, but you might be asking, well, then why are we here? If this is a good project, it's gonna help. Um, why are we doing this TEFRA, TEFRA hearing? TEFRA stands for the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act. It was created to make sure tax rules and for certain bonds and enforced proper, were enforced properly. According to Section 147F of the Internal Revenue Code, a TEFRA hearing is required if a nonprofit borrower wants to get tax accept bonds through a conduit issuer like California Municipal Finance Authority or CMFA. This hearing is needed so that the interest of the bonds can stay tax exempt. The law says that, the, that an elective representative must hold a hearing in the area where the project is happening. In this case, that is our city. It allows the community to speak in favor or against the use of the bonds for the project. This will have no fiscal impact on our city. Our job is just to hold a hearing and approve a resolution to let CMFA issue the bonds. After that, CMFA will handle the process to issue the bonds and investors will look to the borrower, which in this case is 220 Quinn's LP or Quinn's Interfaith Housing Foundation for the repayment. The city will have no financial or legal responsibility for the repayment of the bonds issued under resolution number 2024-144. The bonds will be in the amount up to $55 million and the money will be used to finance or refinance Quinn Street Senior Projects. Project. Separate from this requirement that will be imposed by the new bonds, the city already does have a regulatory agreement with the borrower. The regulatory agreement requires that 142 of the 145 dwelling units be reserved for occupancy by residents 55 and older. The borrower will accept and assume the rights, duties, and obligations under the agreement for the full 55-year term. The city's Housing and Neighborhood Services Division will continue to monitor compliance with this regulatory agreement throughout its term. Escondido has a, senior population, has a growing senior population, making affordable housing for seniors a critical need. This project will provide 145 units specifically dedicated to senior residents. The project is located in the Gateway Transit District, a critical area for urban development and accessibility, ensuring that seniors can easily access public transportation, services, and local amenities. The Quinn Street Senior Project aligns with the city's mission to provide more affordable senior housing. It also directly aligns with Escondido's 2020 to 2024 consolidated plan, focusing on developing and preserving affordable housing for senior and low income residents. It also supports the city's broader goal of prompting both affordable housing and urban development. Importantly, these bonds do not only create any do not create any financial burden for the city, so taxpayers won't be affected. 
second. Tonight, we will be asking for you to conduct a public hearing and adopt resolution number 2024-144, approving the issuance of revenue bonds by the California Municipal Finance Authority to finance or refinance the acquisition, construction, improvement, and equipping of a senior multifamily rental housing project located at 220 North Quinn Street and adopt resolution number 2024-145, approving the assumption of an existing regulatory agreement between the City of Escondido and San Diego Interfaith Housing Foundation. This con oh, the approval will also allow for this project to ensure housing for 145 seniors and a key urban development area. And this concludes our pr presentation. If you have any questions, we please feel free. Thank you. Do we have any public <laughs> comments on this item? None. All right, close the public hearing. I have no questions. I'm gonna go ahead and move to approve resolutions number 2024-144 and resolution 2024-145. Ask for a second and I'll open it up for discussion. Perfect, second. Any discussion? Thank you, great work on this. This is, you know, something that we're really trying to address. So thank you for your hard work, appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much. That was easy. Please open the voting. Voting is open. Motion approved, five zero. Awesome, thank you. That brings us to item 10, which is the abandoned commercial building vacancy ordinance. Welcome, Jennifer. Welcome, Pedro. Time is yours. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and City Council. My name is Jennifer Shenick. I'm the Director of Economic Development, and here is my colleague, Pedro. Thank you, Mayor and Deputy Mayor and City Council. Pedro Gardenas, Management Analyst, Economic Development. Empty commercial buildings and lots throughout the city negatively impact the character and the economy of Escondido. These buildings and lots attract unwanted activities such as litter, encampments, and crime. They cost the city's code enforcement and police teams time and money. They create blight, reducing pedestrian traffic. They hurt nearby businesses and city revenue, lower rents for nearby properties, and diminish community perception. Currently, the city economic development team has various programs to help commercial property owners retain and secure new tenants. Our team has a support page that connects business and property owners directly to our team for support and resources, real estate location services, and business promotion. We also, as a city, offer a small business improvement grant for facade improvements and also crime prevention through environmental design, otherwise known as SEPTED improvements, which many businesses in our community have taken advantage of. And we also have a void analysis tool to help identify gaps in the trade area and provide insights on which businesses might be successful in currently vacant buildings in our city. So in our city, this is an example of our commercial market in downtown um, Escondido. So this ordinance applies to all vacant commercial property throughout the city of Escondido. And this example shows why this ordinance is important for our city. In downtown Escondido along Grand Avenue, we have seen businesses leave at a rate of over 500% in the last 12 months prior to the start of construction downtown. Motivated property owners quickly fill their vacant locations when a tenant leaves. However, while vacancy rates continue to increase downtown, some property owners are also continuing to increase the cost of rent, causing more businesses to leave downtown and making it difficult to attract new businesses to the area. The process of arriving today at City Council started in fall of 2022 at the staff level when economic development staff recognized that traditional business attraction programs were not being effective to incentivize property owners to find tenants. Exploration began to find other tools and best practices used in other cities to reduce vacancy rates. We then met with additional staff members and teams and presented the proposed ordinance to the Economic Development Subcommittee. 
and in September the subcommittee gave recommendation to bring the item to council. So with that I will pass it over to my colleague Pedro to explain the details of the ordinance. Thank you Jennifer. So I'll go over uh, the ordinance as it pr is proposed. This will be adopted as Chapter 6, Article 21 in our Municipal Code as Abandoned Commercial Property Requirements. The ordinance starts with some important definitions such as abandon, as it says in the title, abandon meaning that a property is vacant and is not part of an active foreclosure process or recovery from one. We also wanted to make sure that we defined vacant, uh, vacant, and that in this ordinance means that, that a commercial property, which is not legally occupied. And when we say commercial, we wanted to make sure that we, this is all encompassing, and the definition here is any building or structure that is used for retail, office, industrial, or any other business purpose. And that really covers uh, properties such as shop, uh, shopping centers, storefronts, office buildings, and warehouses. What the registration will look like is that an owner of a vacant commercial property will be responsible for filling out a registration form on a form that is going to be provided by the city. That registration form will include, uh, will ask that uh, the owner of a vacant commercial property to provide the following information. That's going to include the name, address, and phone number uh, so that we have a, a contact uh, for that vacant commercial building. If for some reason that responsible person is not uh, within a hundred mile radius of that vacant commercial property, then they must designate a local, a local contact so that uh, the city does have someone uh, to be able to correspond with. They must also describe in that registration form the methods by which they are securing uh, their vacant commercial property against any unauthorized entry. And the next, two, uh, the next two parts of the registration form are really for our economic development team uh, so that we can best support business and property owners uh, to help them uh, secure, uh, secure a tenant in their vacant commercial properties. They have to declare any future, any future use for their vacant property that's permitted under our Escondido Municipal Code. And we'd like them to inform our team of any challenges that they faced uh, so that uh, in accomplishing that same uh, future use so that we can support them in getting uh, a tenant. What you see here are the proposed fees for this vacancy ordinance. It's divided in two parts, first being a registration fee of $1,042, as well as a monitoring fee that covers the full 12 months of the registration of $3,432. Uh, $32, which is a total of $4,474, which is an upfront registration at the time uh, they, they submit that form. This is a full cost recovery program, so the way we calculated these fees is uh, by associating it with the staff time that it takes to implement this program. Moving on to property maintenance requirements, uh, the responsible person will need to maintain their vacant commercial property and make sure that it abides by all state, local, and federal uh, property maintenance requirements, meaning they must uh, comply with the city's uh, sign ordinance, for example. We also wanted to make sure that any buildings on the property with a fire sprinkler, for example, uh, must be maintained in working order and in compliance with all local, state, and federal laws. Um, it al also buildings, uh, vacant buildings that have a centralized and registered fire and bur burglar alarm system uh, must be maintained in working order and we are actually requesting monthly reports to make sure uh, that those are maintained in working order. Those will, be, uh, those will be reviewed by our code compliance team. And lastly, any buildings that are without fire sprinkler systems or fire or burglar alarm systems uh, shall be provided, uh, shall be required to have continuous physical monitoring uh, by means of on-site patrol of their vacant property. Additionally, the responsible person for a vacant commercial property will also be required to have an 8x5 an 8.5 by 11 inch sign that details the responsible person's contact information as well as uh, the city's code compliance and police department contact information if uh, the city is trying to get in contact with them or a resident needs to uh, submit a complaint about the vacant property this information will be available on the vacant commercial property. The building official uh, will also have the authority to recommend additional uh, 
additional requirements for any properties that have ongoing nuisances, for example, or criminal activity, and they can require uh, property owners to implement additional maintenance and uh, security measures. So this includes additional lighting, I think it could include increased inspection frequency or even hiring of an on-site security if there is continued nuisance with that specific uh, property. Also, it will be required to have a complete floor plan that's going to, going to be submitted to the city. And this is just in case of any kind of emergencies like a fire or any uh, catastrophic events. To wrap up the ordinance summary, uh, there is an opportunity for uh, the owner of a vacant commercial property to be refunded uh, at least of the monitoring fee that they have paid up front. So for example, if, if they are able to secure a tenant that is in line with what is allowed in our municipal code, uh, then they would be refunded for the remainder of the registration. This is really an incentive. We want to make sure that we are uh, incentivizing good actors and making sure that uh, if people do get a, a tenant in their vacant commercial property, that we are able to give a refund of the monitoring fee. So in summary, really the goal of this program is to decrease blight and increase business activity in the city of Escondido. And city staff, uh, we, we will be monitoring this program and we'll be reporting to the City Council Economic Development Subcommittee and we'll be recommending any updates uh, that will go to City Council for approval. And in conclusion, the recommended action for this item is to adopt ordinance number 2024-13 and adopt resolution number 2024-153, which adopts the fees for this program. Thank you for your time, and we're open to questions. Thank you both. Do we have any public comments on this item? Not in person, just three submitted online, two in favor, one opposed. Okay, thank you. Um, this is exciting. One of those things I feel like we've been working on since I got here, um, and to see it finally come to fruition is very exciting. One of the questions I get asked most is, what is the city doing about all the vacant buildings? And, you know, it, this is in part to hold some people accountable um, for the blight that you see around town, just blatant blight. Um, but on the flip side, having a tool to connect people who are interested in doing business in the city, I think is an excellent thing as well. Um, one question I had that we didn't go over in the subcommittee was, so if a property is sold, how do we make sure the new owner is on the registry and all of that. So every, um, for the registry, there's an annual renewal process. So while we will try to, um, while we will try to reach out to every new property owner, there is a possibility that we may not know when properties change hands, but when it comes to the annual renewal, we will be able to see if that property is still vacant, okay. um, but there will be a requirement for that new property owner to still be registering that building Un or lot. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes my, my questions. I will go ahead and move to approve ordinance number 2024-13, as well as resolution number 2024-153. I have a second. Yeah, I was going to open it up. Go ahead. <laughs> and we all had the opportunity to uh, receive your, um, your instructions and your uh, explanation of everything prior to, and I, we appreciate that. Had that opportunity to ask a lot of questions then. One of the questions I forgot to ask was in regards to um, vacant lots and or the maintenance of those lots and especially the safety factor um, it, with the condition that some of the lots are left in. Let's say a building has been raised, it's not completely uh, eliminated, there's still a foundation, there's still posts and things sticking out. Uh, there may be fencing around it, but yet there's no maintenance occurring at all on on those lots how does that come into play as far as this ordinance is concerned it's not actually a vacant building it's a vacant lot so. correct so this ordinance covers lots as well we want to make sure that those property owners of lots especially those with the concerns that you mentioned are also being monitored by the city and this ordinance gives our code compliance and building department the ability to um, request additional maintenance or improvements. Would that also include county-owned properties within our 
jurisdiction that um, are unkept? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Are you accusing the county of having unkept buildings <laughs> or properties here? Absolutely. And, and I would note, our council member, that we also have other general nuisance um, provisions that I, th I went over just the other week or so that can be used for vacant lots as well. So to the extent these don't, they, they, they work together, I think. So. Um, I just want to echo what the mayor said. We've been really looking into this, uh, especially on Grand Avenue, but other places as well, as including East Valley Parkway. Uh, so I just really want to commend you for the great work that you did. This is, I know, almost two years in the making, and um, I just, just thank you so much. I think a lot of business owners and a lot of neighbors really want this, so thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the briefing earlier in the week, and I'm glad um, Councilmember Morosco asked about the lots because there has been a abandoned um, gas station on East Valley Parkway that has just been a problem for years, and um, we've sent notice of violations, and they have done nothing. So there's been lots of time and opportunity for compliance and for businesses to try to be part of the solution and this is that next extra step and nudge we have to give so um, I'm I'm very supportive um, just a couple other things that I want to lift up in my observation because you were showing statistics and maybe we can go to that that uh, slide where you talk about the numbers of um, the vacancy rate um, how you know traditionally if um, if a building is sitting on the on you know on the market for long they they lower the prices of the rent not increase it that's you know a strange trend another thing and I don't know if this happens in other cities but it's definitely an issue in Escondido and I know because I've tried um, renting spaces on a short-term basis is that many um, buildings won't even entertain a lease below be um, below uh, three years less than three years, which is really problematic for a brand new business that's just starting out to know like what their future looks like. You know, you don't, you lose money usually your first three years, definitely your first year. So for three years, you're going to commit to a lease that's at the mark at the high level of the market, right? So for me, I don't know if that's a trend in other cities, but I, I could say calling different realtors, which kind of all end up being the same realtor. Um, <laughs> for the city of Escondido, it's like the, it's, they've kind of got a monopoly on the on the real estate market for commercial. It's minimum three years, and I just find that a contributor to this issue as well of um, being able to find tenants for that. So, real estate, uh, you know, professionals, let's talk because I think that that's also another, you know other ways that we can maybe partner to try to bring tenants into those buildings. Um, qu um, can we go to the slide that shows about the um, transparency on like who manages a property? Because I really appreciated that. I think there was another one. It, it's, uh, there it is, thank you. So here it says, you know, this property is, man there's going to be a sign in the empty buildings that say, you know, this property is managed by and to report problems I don't know who the report problems if that's going to be the property manager, if that's going to be the city. Um, but is there a reason we didn't include who the who owns the property? Because a lot of times that's not who manages the property. Correct. In this ordinance, we provided them the ability to put a point of contact so that that person could be contacted for problems and concerns. So the problems and concerns will be the contact. Uh, we'll list the contact information of the manager, but in this particular instance, um, we have listed that if the property owner or the designee is outside 100 miles, they'll need to designate someone that is closer, that is this contact person. Okay. So there's an option for either or in this situation. Okay, so it could be it could be the owner, but then they if they live like in another state, you know, someone that's local that's accessible. Correct. That makes sense. Um, okay, well, good. And oh, one, just one thing that I want to also share. Um, I know this will be annual, so if, in, you know, because this is something new, and I know there was an, uh, a email that was sent to us with concerns from one of the realtors, um, 
you know, it would be good to get before the one year because this is so new and we're the first in the county to have this, to my understanding. I don't know if you ever found out if City of San Diego already had passed theirs, but I would love to get, you know, periodic updates of how it's going um, before the one year, if possible, whether that's a memo to us or something. Excellent. Thank you. Our team will be providing updates and we'll also include updates on this program in our annual um, comprehensive economic development strategy report to council as well. Great. Thank you. Did we ever find out about City of San Diego? They do not have. Okay. So we are, we would be the first. Correct. Great. Thank you. So um, as a member of the subcommittee, I want to thank you for the uh, time that you've put into this. It's something that we have been hearing over a very long time. And uh, we believe that this will, uh, as has been mentioned, nudge some of the uh, owners uh, to uh, be more open for um, uh, leasing the, the property. Just one thing that I really, really want to thank you, and I mentioned it in our last meeting, the fire suppression system, all right? I think that whomever came up with that, genius, uh, thank you so much because that is so, so important to keep that going and to have, and if it's not available, to have actual monitoring presence of uh, licensed security to period periodically come by and checking on the properties, I think is, is, is an extremely important element to this. So uh, ordinance, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. And I'm in support. <laughs> I hope so. Awesome. Anything else? Okay. Thank you both uh, for all the time and energy you put into this. Much appreciated. Please open the voting. Voting is open. Motion approved. Five zero. All right. On to current current business. Item eleven: proposed fee increase for emergency medical service ambulance transportation. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council Members. I'm John Tenger, your Fire Chief, and presenting with me this evening is Division Chief Tyler Batson. This evening, we will review our current emergency medical services fee schedule and provide content on our need to align with rising operational costs and to ensure continued high-quality emergency medical services for our community. In July of 2016, previous council adopted resolution 2016-57 to our current emergency medical services fee schedule. After a user fee study was conducted in early 2024, city council directed staff to bring forward an updated citywide fee schedule to discuss this further and provide more content. I will turn this presentation over to Chief Batson. The Escondido Fire Department hired consulting firm AP Triton to provide an ambulance transportation fee study. Fire staff and AP Triton worked closely through the study to reveal that the current fee structure no longer covers rising expenses. Data is from fiscal year 23. Annual cost of service of $10.826 million reflects the operational cost of our ambulance system only. Annual fee revenue of $8.337 million is from all payer mixes, including private pay uninsured, private insurance, Medi-Cal, and Medicare. In fiscal year 23, we transported 11,077 patients, resulting in an average reimbursement rate for fiscal year 23 of $752 per patient transport. Our last EMS transport fee increase in uh, occurred in 2016. The current slide shows ambulance fee comparisons from neighboring cities. The, a the average fee is $3,200 per transport, not including Escondido's current rate. The consultant is recommending three changes. First, 
an increase in the transport base rate fee, second, simplified billing, and third, an annual CPI adjustment based on the U.S. Healthcare Inflation Rate Index. First recommendation, in relation to the transport fee increase, we have two base rate options. Base rate option one, in compliance with council direction, increase the transport fee for 100% cost recovery based on fiscal year 23 ambulance system costs. Base rate option two, increase the fee to the regional average. And a hybrid option, increase the rate to the regional average beginning in 2025 to 3200 and then an increase to the full cost recovery amount beginning in 2026. This is similar to how some of our other City of Escondido departments have increased their fees. Second change recommended. Following the enactment of AB 716, which governs, EM governs EMS billing, our ambulance billing company recommends more simplified invoicing to better align with payer billing codes in an effort to streamline recovery. And the third recommendation, beginning in 2026, an annual automatic base rate CPI adjustment based on the U.S. healthcare inflation rate. The current inflation rate for 2024 is 2.47%. Using the option one transport fee base rate of $4,276 would result in 2.489 million of additional cost recovery using the same 2023 transport statistics. Using option two transport fee base rate of $3,200, the regional average provides 1.462 million in additional cost recovery. Option one cost recovery equates to 100% of fiscal year 23 ambulance system cost and an average payment per transport increased to $977. Option two cost recovery equates to 91% of ambulance system cost and an average payment per transport of $885. That concludes our presentation. Staff would like to request that City Council adopt resolution number 2024-152 approving either option one, option two, or option three, a phased in approach of options one and two to the city user fee schedule and authorize annual inflation adjustments based on the U.S. healthcare inflation rate. Thank you, we're available for any questions you may have. Thank you, do we have any public comments? No? None. Okay, I had all my questions answered in our two two ones the other day, um, I think. I'm, I'm in favor of option three, the phased approach to get to 100%, but I'd like to hear um, what my colleagues have to say. So I'll open it up for discussion. Can you make a proposal? Please do. Make a proposal that we accept option one. Any seconds? Yeah, I'll second that. Thanks. Go ahead. I, I would be in favor of option two or, th or three. Um, I know one, one question that was answered. Sorry, did anybody else? No. So, okay. Um, one question that we, that we had when we were discussing this, but I want to make this, I want to make sure the public knows this, is <clears throat> so when we're looking at option one, which is the 100% um, cost recovery, do we have the details of, you know, if somebody is, what's the, what's the, do we have the percentage of people who are insured, uninsured, what they're insured by? And I also want to talk about the people who are uninsured and how they could get insured. And does that matter? Residency status, does that matter? So I know that's probably three questions, but I think we, we've answered them and I just want to make sure that the public hears it. Yes, sir. Uh, as far as the residency status, it, it, it doesn't matter. The service cost remains the same. Um, looking at our numbers from July 23 to June 24 is kind of the, the closest payer mix that we have available for. Uh, we had Medi-Cal patients, 21.7%. Um, we have a very high concentration of Medicare patient, 46.6% of our customers in that time frame were Medicare. Uh, uninsured was 22.7% in, in that same time frame and private insurance made up 8.3%.
And the ones that are insured by Medi-Cal, Medicare, or private, how much do they usually pay out of pocket? When it comes to Medicare, uh, it depends on which plan they have, but uh, the maximum reimbursement is $650, and that's with um, the patient paying their 20% copay. There's some variations on that, but that's the most amount we can expect with a Medicare patient. The, currently, it's $650. Uh, with Medi-Cal, uh, it's also fixed uh, at $118.50, but we also benefit from the IGT program, so all Medi-Cal patients, our reimbursement is $1,065, so that program brings that reimbursement up considerably, but that's also a fixed amount. Um, can I add in here real quick, council member? I think to your, your original question, um, if someone's here and they happen to have Medi-Cal or Medicare, regardless of whether they're documented or not, they still c can get that insurance and be covered. Thank you. And, and how much would they end up paying out of pocket usually? And it, I'm sorry, when they do pay out of pocket, they are able to be put on like payment plans and everything like that, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. And then there's some additional protections with that. Okay. And people who are uninsured, typically they would qualify for either private insurance or Medi-Cal or Medicare, right? We, we think so. Okay, so that should be an initiative that the city takes and make sure that we get as many people as possible um, insured. Okay, thank you. Comments, if possible. Yeah. Um, if you can go back to the, the slide that shows what other municipalities are, are where they're currently at, and you can see that we're extremely low. And um, the, s several of the other municipalities, a couple of the other municipalities could potentially be increasing their fees as well. Um, we've created a situation where we are continuously in the red because of our, uh, our reduced charges and uh, we, we have to pull off the Band-Aid. We have to, you know, just get this taken care of and get it rectified. So go to the slide that shows what the difference between option one and option two is as far as what a, uh, the base rate. Now, I think there's one more slide. Um, go again. Again. So average projected payment per transportation is $977 on option one. What is it on option two? 885, so it's $90 difference um, between option one and, and option two with uh, transportation. Um, and so with that in mind, I think we, we need to uh, not try to uh, soft shoe this thing into existence, I think we need to go ahead and make the move and get full cost recovery as we've been attempting to do um, because of our budget situation uh, in, in every department, in every, in every um, a, uh, aspect uh, of the city and, and function, whether it's in licensing or fees or permits, or whatever it may be. So I'm in favor of full cost recovery as soon as possible and not trying to phase this thing uh, to death. Yeah, and I was going to say, too, um, I, I'm okay with option three. The reason I seconded it was because it was a $92 difference, and trying to phase in um, that, that small of a difference might be unnecessary. So, yeah, go ahead. Three. Option three was phasing in. So it was, it was going from option two to option one. It was seeking full cost recovery, but in a matter of two or three years. Oh, one year, it, sir. Oh, one year. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's, it's and, and that's why I seconded it. It's a it's a ninety two dollar difference. Yeah, so it's it's, it's it's moot. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. So um, I have a question. I don't know if you have the answer. Uh, one thousand six hundred and sixty eight was the increase, or the, that's the fee that it's been since two thousand and sixteen, right? Okay. And at that point, when that was increased to that amount. Was it 100%, um, uh, was it cost recovery at that point or we were behind already at that point? It's my understanding we, we re, um, raised it from $1,000 per transport to the 1668. But, but we don't know if, uh, we, don't ha we don't know if it was 100% cost recovery at that point already. I do not know that, sir. Okay, all right. I'm, I was 
curious about that. Um, and eight years of being behind the eight ball is 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 one of the aspects why we are uh, facing the the budgetary issues that we are facing. So. Um, uh, I, I also was fine with option uh, three to phase it in over one year, and I did ask you uh, in our, our 221s if you were able to be able to do that, but 90, what was it, $91? $92 difference, I'm, I'm okay with uh, uh, option one. Thank you. And so, so that we're, we're kind of, I'm seeing the numbers, I guess, differently. Like, I understand the averages are, are only that signif that small of a difference, but the amounts are actually over $1,000, correct? You're taking the average. Yes, ma'am. Which is why it looks like it's insignificant. But in reality, 4,267 versus 302,000 is, is 3,200 is a, over a $1,000 difference. So 90 versus 1,000, there's, there's a very different impact there. Um, when you do the average, it makes it seem like it's not a lot, but in, but it is a lot. It's about it's over a thousand dollar difference. So that's why for me, two or three um, is something I would support. I mean, we're going to get to full cost recovery. It's just you know letting people know it's coming. You know we know that you know there's sticker shock and you know it's just a matter of again we're we're going to get there. It's just a matter of like giving notice going from. 1668 to 4267 is a huge difference. So I feel like it's, you know, if we can allow people that advance notice, we're still going to get it. But it is a thousand over a thousand dollar difference, not just ninety dollars. That is correct per transport. Well, when would this be implemented? January first, 2025. I see your finger reaching. You can call for the vote. I was just going to say, if there's no other comments or questions, I'll call for the vote. Voting is open. Yes. Option one. <clears throat> Motion approved, 4 1. Martinez, no. Lost my place here. Okay, uh, number 12, designation of voting delegate, the National League of Cities annual conference. Thank you, guys. Yes, thank you. Yes, Honorable Mayor, this is the opportunity the council has to appoint a voting delegate as well as an alternate for a conference taking place <laughs> next month in Tampa, Florida. And the two attending are Councilmember Garcia and Councilmember Martinez. Great. <laughs> Uh, Councilmember Garcia and Councilmember Martinez, it is your discretion as to who you would like to be the voting delegate and then an alternate. Um, and, and this is where the city manager is going to say, there's still time to register if you want to go. <laughs> go ahead. Aren't you reach, out, reach out to Lori. <laughs> um, do either one of you have a preference? I don't have a preference. Do you have a preference, Councilmember Garcia? Have you been a voting delegate before? I've not gone to an, uh, one of these before um, at the national level. Yeah, at same for me at the national level, this would be, I believe, the first time that we would have a voting member. Uh, I've had the opportunity uh, for Cal Cities. This was my first time this year as the alternate to be able to be the voting member representing the city. Um, so I don't have. I know I'll be there. Um, because Are you going to be there for the resolutions when they do the vote? I'll, I'll, I'll still be there, yes. Okay. So I don't know if your schedule allows you to be there. Yeah, I'm going to um, be there. But I'm open. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's your choice, Mayor, right? Oh, is it my choice? I, I was going to say YouTube. Appointment, appointment uh, right? Yeah. You get to put forth the nomination. Meeny, okay. meeny, miny, mo. Do either one of you have a preference on who is the voting member? Go ahead and put me. I'll, I'll be the I'll be the Perfect. voting member. Voting member, alternate. alternate. Yeah, that's fine. All right, that's my motion. I have a second. Let's vote. The voting is open. Motion approved. Five zero. Awesome. Item thirteen is the San Diego County Water Authority Board of Directors appointment. Um, did you have a? Oh, okay. Go ahead.
Honorable Mayor, City Council, uh, this is concerning the San Diego County Water Authority Board of Directors. Uh, on September 8th, our current representative, Tom Kennedy, submitted a le letter of resignation uh, that would go into effect as soon as we appoint his replacement. Members appointed uh, to this jurisdiction are appointed by each city. There are no alternates for our members. Uh, however, the City of Vista serves as our proxy in the absence of a representative on the board. The term is set to expire on October 18th of 2028. Uh, and then if you were to move forward with approving this resolution, it would appoint this member to that board. Uh, interviews are not required by council policy or municipal code for this seat as an interagency board. Uh, they are required when we do boards and commissions that are appointed to citizens as well. So that concludes staff presentation. Okay, yeah, just to be clear, uh, Mr. Kennedy told me he was going to submit his letter of resignation because he was eyeing a seat on the Rincon del Diablo uh, Water District Board of Directors, and he can't do both at the same time. And that one comes with health benefits. So um, I think it was a, a, a better choice for him and his family. Um, during the last interview process, I was already talking to Mr. Rick Paul about the appointment uh, before Mr. Kennedy had told me he was interested um, now that he's going, my recommendation is to appoint Mr. Rick Paul to the San Diego County Water Authority. Um, he has the time necessary. I know his, he's been dedicated on the Planning Commission. I think anybody that knows him knows he reads every line of every agenda that this city publishes, along with the Clean Energy Alliance. Um, that and he's agreed to go to the, I forget what they call it, the water... The Citizens Academy. Okay, yeah, he's agreed to go to the next Water Citizens Academy. Um, yeah, and with that being said, I would move to make him our appointee. Would ask for a second, and I'll open it up for discussion. Second, perfect. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, just you know, I know last time we did have an interview process. Is there a reason we didn't maybe consider some of the other applicants that? There was actually a couple of different applicants I had considered. The reason why we're not doing interviews and kind of rushing through this is I was already leaning towards him the first time. Tom Kennedy stepped in, and obviously he was the, the clear choice. But I believe if we don't do this now, we won't have a representative for the next meeting. Okay. And then does that mean we're um, – we're, I, don't, I don't know when the next Clean Energy Alliance – he's on the Citizen Committee too, right? he is yeah no for me it's just you know if we just I'm just lifting this up I, I'm you know I don't have a I'm not protesting his <laughs> involvement it is a lot of a huge time commitment and you know if he has a time um, I know that he will do the homework um, and report back to us the only thing is I guess just I want to lift up for future that we you know allow a diverse pool of residents so that other people get opportunities to also serve on boards you know so we're not having like one person serve on multiple boards for the city. That would just kind of be something I want to raise for future appointments and things like that. For sure. Thank you. All right, Mr. What other boards are you on? No. Citizens. Board Clean Energy. We appointed um, him and another person, right? Okay, Clean Energy. That's yeah, right. and that was that was also well. I think he was on the Planning Commission, so he was he's kind of always served on two things at a, at the same time. That's what that's what I was lifting up. Thank you. I'll let him know his days are numbered on the other one. <laughs> um, no, I, I hear you. I absolutely do. Um, and at the same time, I think Rick Paul has been, he served really well. And, and I do want to echo what's been said is that he does go through things very thoroughly. Um, he's spoken to me in person about his concerns. So he, I know he's, he's very qualified and I think he'll, I think he would do a good job, but I hear your concerns and I think that's something we should, we need to consider for the, the next appointments. Absolutely. So I'll chime in and uh, I've worked with uh, Rick uh, Paul on planning for a number of years and uh, definitely one of the uh, better prepared uh, commissioners on that. Um, also, uh, when I was on the CEA, he also, uh, he was already um, on the, uh, appointed to the citizens, um, what is it, uh, advisory, the citizens advisory. Uh, very well prepared, goes to the, not only goes to the meetings, but any training of, uh, opportunities. Uh, so, and one more thing is that he's available to report, to talk to us, to let us know. I found it a little bit uh, difficult to be able to connect 
uh, uh, with our current uh, representative. I've reached out a number of times and never received any, any feedback from him, any answer. Uh, so I, I know that Rick uh, would, would be always available when we needed him. So I think it's a good choice and I definitely support him. If nothing else, I'll open the voting. Voting is open. I guess I'll ask you to open it. <laughs> Motion approved. Five zero. Okay, on to future agenda. Um, I do have one item. I need to apologize to the city manager because normally I tell you before I ask for an agenda item and uh, maybe we can meet and discuss about what exactly I'm looking for, but I would like the city council to have a discussion on our current sign ordinance and regulations. Anybody else? Cool. Let's move on to council member. Not technically, but we'll do it anyways. The only, only one is the mayor. The mayor doesn't per the council. But I'll ask for one. Well, Lottie frickin'. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Second? Perfect. And Council Member Morosco, want to kick us off? Real quick, um, this past week, 100-year uh, uh, anniversary or, or celebration of farming in Escondido, Farm Stand West, had a really uh, a, a lot of uh, interaction, a lot of uh, good activities going on there. And this coming Saturday, EPD is doing trunk or treat at um, Woodward, right? Woodward parking lot? In it? Yeah, Woodward parking lot here in Escondido. So check it out. Uh, so I um, had the opportunity this uh, last week to represent the city. Uh, at uh, the League of California Cities, and uh, that was uh, all as usual. Great training, uh, great opportunity, a lot of networking. It was it was great. Uh, I also had the opportunity to be uh, our uh, representative on the Sandag board uh, last uh, week. Uh, that was great. Trunk or treat, also uh, awesome. Uh, Friday, I had the opportunity to be at the. Uh, dinner uh, event for the promotoras in San Diego, the San Diego region. Uh, I had uh, uh, the privilege to be able to speak a little bit there uh, regarding their, um, uh, the work uh, that they do. Um, and uh, we had an economic subcommittee on uh, Monday and I'm just checking my calendar here to see and make sure I don't miss anything, some briefings and uh, I must say that I had the opportunity as I was, when I was in Cal Cities to stay on the Queen Mary and uh, it's haunted. <laughs> it's haunted. I, I did not know that until a few days before I got there and then I asked the young lady as I checked in to my, my, my suite or stateroom, I don't know what it's called. Uh, I had never stayed on a boat before and um, she said, oh, I said, what a ship, thank you. What is, uh, what room is the haunted one? And she said, oh, your floor is the one with the most activity. I said, amen, thank you very much. Uh, but anyway, I slept just fine and it was, it was great. It was a wonderful experience, but that's been my letting everybody know that I slept on a ship that was, uh, that is haunted. All right, uh, yeah, Economic Development Subcommittee uh, went through a list of the city's uh, uh, property portfolio. Look forward to bringing back some recommendations for the council to consider at a later time. On Saturday night, I believe, I went to the Escondido High School marching band field tournament with a handful of other high schools in the county. And I had the opportunity to go on field and hand the winner their trophy. It was really an awesome event. I've never seen a marching band before, so um, it, was, it was an excellent introduction. Um, again, on Saturday was the North County Veterans Stand Down event, and that was, um, that was a pretty incredible event. I had a brief opportunity to speak to some of the veterans and, and just hang out. I volunteered at the Escondido Art Association booth, and really just a, a phenomenal event, and I, I hope that they're able to secure the same location for next year. Um, last week was the International Credit Union Day. Um, 
I didn't even know that existed, but we had a proclamation and proclaimed the day, so it was great. Um, met with some leaders from North Coast Church who are working on the Serve Your, their, their uh, I don't know, they do a Serve Your City event every year and a half, uh, and this year's in Escondido. The Neighborhood Healthcare tour of their new headquarters off of, I think, Juniper, and then uh, again, the street fair, and I was also at the Escondido Union High School District Board of Directors meeting to recognize the student of the month, and that concludes my report. All right, thank you. Yesterday we had a chamber, uh, there was a youth chamber mixer. It was a pretty great event. Yeah, the mayor was there, don't worry, I'll mention you. Um, it was a really cool event. It was a lot of young professionals that are looking to, you know, the future leaders, I think, of the city of the county. So I think that was really, really cool experience. And there was how many? Like 40. Yeah, there was something like 40 people there, and there was a costume contest, so that was cool. Um, we had the uh, the the um, Center for the Arts subcommittee meeting today. I really highly recommend people look at the website and see all the cool events that are coming up. We have uh, events for the Dia de los Muertos. We have uh, Christmas events. Um, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of cool events. I know a few of them that I'm definitely planning to go to. Um, <clears throat> always meeting with constituents on on a weekly basis. And as always, thank you for the privilege of serving. What day is Dia de los Muertos? November 1st, it'll be a Friday. Council day, which is nice, so we can go and <laughs> see. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to loop back on, um, I, was on I was on the policy committee meeting for the Air Pollution Control District, and I know, um, Councilman Morasco, you wanted me to ask about the, um, you know, uh, multi-agency coordination, and so it is something that I brought up during my um, comments of that committee meeting, and we're supposed to be meeting, I believe, in September, um, and so there is something called an incidence response plan, and it is something that will be coming before the board, so we'll make sure to, I've alerted staff that that's something important to us, and so um, there is gonna be an agenda item in the future, don't have a date yet, but we'll, we will be talking about that. Um, and additionally, APCD, the Air Pollution Control District, has been very involved with the Tijuana River um, Valley sewage crisis. Um, in the in the summer, they had you know um, with the heat and extra flows from equipment not working and not because it wasn't being maintained properly, they had you know oh, thousands of complaints come through. And so it's got it's gotten better since then. The heat just made it worse. Um, but also, um, we directed staff to send a letter to Governor Newsom and President Biden, really emphasizing the importance of um, declaring a um, you know, emergency, national emergency. So that is in the works, and hopefully they'll be more responsive to the letter from the Air Pollution Control District than they've been to other inquiries of other elected officials. Um, so yeah, we had a CCAE, the Center for the Arts Subcommittee meeting, and shared about lots of events. Um, which I'm excited about the other Los Muertos, and we will have the um, um, what is the the holiday one again, the the Northern Lights, yeah. that Northern Lights they call it, Winter Wonderland. Yeah, the Winter Wonderland will still be, I believe, two days of you know Christmas holiday activities, including snow, and it's going to be moved to the front of the of the center, which is exciting. Um, on Sunday, this look at this beautiful book. I if I get extra copies, I'll share with you colleagues. Um, but my Rotary Club, the Rotary Club of Escondido, turned 100 years old on Sunday, and so we celebrated an amazing centennial celebration, and we had um, the Rotary International President come to Escondido and give a really inspiring speech, so that was fun. And then the next day, I did attend the student concert for the black violin um, artists, who I see every time they're here, but I had to miss them Sunday because of the Rotary event, but I'm happy that I attended the concert with the students. Um, they were so, so excited. It was an amazing show just an hour long but the kids just loved loved it so much and I just you know a big highlight was really their reaction to the music um, so yeah really excited about that and that is all that I have my my community cleanups are starting back up now with the heat behind us um, even though it was 80 something degrees today <laughs> I will be beginning those in November for the monthly cleanups in district one thank you city manager report nothing to report fantastic this meetings adjourned <laughs>